Jessica King. This doesn't make any sense. Uh, thanks everyone for having me here. Thanks, Stuart. Um, okay, so as you know, I am Jessica King and I work for Intopia. No pressure. Um, <laughs> so today I'm going to talk about cognitive disability. I will use the terms disability and impairment interchangeably. We can talk about language use after the talk later. Um, so just a bit of background about myself. So I have a heart condition, so I've grown up with a physical disability, but a couple of years ago I had a brain infection and basically my brain got really squashed. And so now I have a lot of cognitive impairments. And it's been a bit of a uh, crash course in living with cognitive disability. Uh, and I found a lot of trouble uh, just using tech. And so I thought I would share my experiences as well as share ways that you might actually be able to improve your products for people with cognitive impairment. So, cognitive impairment has been described as the last frontier in digital accessibility. And that's because even though we make up a large portion of the disability community, we're not really very well understood. Um, so, basically, if you have a cognitive disability, you're pretty much ignored in digital accessibility. Um, but I realise, before I get too far into the talk, that there's varying levels of knowledge about disability and accessibility in the room. So, oh look there, I didn't even change my slide. So into it. Okay, anyway. Um, anyway, so I realise there's different uh, levels of understanding in the room. So what I'm actually going to do is start out with some disability studies 101. Welcome to my university lecture hall. So. When we talk about disability, we actually refer to models of disability. And models of disability inform how we think about people with disability, their access needs, and their role in society. There's a few models of disability out there, but the ones that we'll probably talk about more and that you'll hear more in the general world out of academia are the medical model and the social model. So, the medical model. The medical model focuses on what is wrong with the individual. It assigns labels to people based on their impairments and just totally removes their personhood. It's all about the disability. And as Ashley said, everything's about fixing that. So it favors cure to fix impairments and to normalize people with disability, even if it doesn't actually add anything to their quality of life. <clears throat> Um, so, and it also tends to lead to low expectations of people with disability and it feeds negative stereotypes. Um, so, the social model is in direct opposition to the medical model. Basically, it was born in the late 1960s on the back of the civil rights movement in the US as people with disabilities actually began to speak on their own behalf. And they put forward this radical idea that they were people first not a disability, and uh, that's why we actually use person-first language. So they developed a way to talk about disability, and this is called the social model. And it basically argues uh, that it's barriers put in place by society that cause disability, rather than somebody's impairment. So barriers can be physical, like stairs leading to a venue, but they can also be assumptions and stereotypes, often fed by medical models. Um, things like people with disability can never work, they can't get an education, they need constant care, they're a burden, stuff like that. So today, when I'm talking about disability, I'm using the social model. Okay, so the social model encourages universal design, and that's design that avoids or minimizes barriers to access. And this benefits people with disability, but everyone else as well. If barriers are removed, more people with disability are able to enter the community and live independently. And universal design is just as applicable for information and communication technologies, so ICT, as it is in the physical world. Okay, so what's cognitive impairment? Okay, first of all, it's an invisible disability. So I don't know if many of you have heard this term, but as the name suggests, you can't actually tell that a person has a disability by looking at them. 
And the thing about invisible disability is that when you have one, you become very, very good at hiding your symptoms or your impairments because you don't want other people to know. It's called passing. And basically we do it because we want to avoid the judgment, the disbelief, the stigma that's associated with being different in a world that values health and bodily perfection over everything else. Um, but that is a rant for another talk. <laughs> so you can't see what we look like, but we're there amongst you. We're probably here right now. Um, so invisible disability can affect people in the same way that a visible disability can. People with a heart and lung disease, lupus, chronic fatigue, cancer, the list is basically endless, require the same accommodations as someone who uses a wheelchair. And as there are many types of vis invisible disability, there are also many types of cognitive disability. Um, some are congenital, so that's gained at birth, and some are gained later in life through a trauma like a brain injury or a stroke. Chronic illness can cause cognitive impairment, and I'm really sorry to tell you, but you're gonna get old and you're gonna get some kind of cognitive impairment. So design for your futures, if nothing else. It affects people of every age group, every background, every level of education. Um, you probably are sitting next to someone or near someone who has a cognitive impairment, but you don't know. So the effects of cognitive disabilities vary from person to person, even amongst people with the same diagnosis. They vary in severity and they may not always be present. So they can be triggered by flares and chronic illness, medications, like if you've ever been on painkillers, you kind of know what it feels like to be a little bit vague or a lot, depending. Um, and also mental health status has a really big effect on uh, cognitive impairment. If you've ever been depressed, you will know what that feels like. So this is gonna be really broad, but some of the impairments experienced by people with cognitive disability can include memory problems. So that's like short-term memory, long-term memory, um, visual memory. So you may not actually be able to remember what things that you've seen looks like. And um, this can actually cause problems with reading and writing. Language may be affected, so written text. And it's not that you may not be able to understand the meaning of individual words. You may understand that, but you can't actually extrapolate that and apply it to your situation. So you may have a set of instructions, it's completely meaningless to you. Uh, what else do we have? Numbers. So you've probably heard of dyslexia. Have you heard of dyscalculia? Um, that's the inability to recognize numerals and can extend as far as um, not being able to use maths to solve problems. Um, lots of people have this, I have this. I can't read numbers longer than six digits. It's fun. Um, and a really, really big one is actually attention problems. It's the difficulty to focus, to stay focused, and then once you're distracted, and because you are so easily distracted, you then have to regain focus, and that's, that's harder again. And because your brain is working overtime, you get cognitive fatigue. And so cognitive fatigue is the worst. It basically increases your impairment because you get stressed, and then you can't think, and then you can't think, and then you're just like, oh, well, I don't care anymore. Um, and so it basically means that you will make mistakes and you'll miss information. So, Let's stop and have a think. All of these people who experience all of this stuff are using technology, and even if it's not their preference to do so. And that's really because we live in a world where the ability to access and use technology is expected. Governments and other service providers encourage you to go online or use an app to manage your account and pay bills. Talking to a real person on the phone or at a branch is actively discouraged. Uh, if you've been on the phone trying to fix your phone bill and constantly when you're on hold, you could do this online. It would be faster if you went online. You'll be here for an hour, but if you went online, you could do it right now. Damn it, I'm calling you for a reason. Um, and it's also really how we stay in touch with our friends and our family. And this is really why accessibility is so important for ICT. If people with disabilities can't access 
um, technology, it basically means that they're excluded from society and they're pushed more and more to the vulnerable edges. So that really sucks and we should absolutely aim to stop that. But to do that, we need to actually get an understanding of the kinds of problems that people with cognitive disability and impairment face when they're actually using technology. So this slide is just going to go through some of them because I tried to make them single and it didn't work. And so now you have an animation and then I'll explain what's going on. So videos that autoplay, and that's ads or otherwise, pop-ups, a chat window that ask you if you want to talk to Veronica about your purchases. They make it really difficult to focus and to understand the content that you're looking for. The unwanted noise and unwanted intrusions, they force the user to stop and try and figure out how to close down this stupid, annoying box. And that's actually problematic for people who have um, trouble with problem solving. Uh, but also trying to refocus again that that complete distraction may force some users to start from the beginning again because they've actually forgotten key information while they were trying to turn off the distraction. So ads or banners that appear in the middle of articles can be really confusing. Um, it may take time for users to realise that what they're looking at is not relevant to what they're reading. So most people with cognitive impairments develop strategies that they use to help them complete tasks and find what they need. But intrusions like this stop them from effectively employing those strategies. It takes control from them and prevents them from actually doing what they need to. And that's what I'm referring to when I'm talking about barriers to access. When you have these things, it, you're raising a barrier. You're actually creating a disability by doing that. So um, lack of linearity or logic in content is another frustration. So recently I wrote an email and I searched for the send button for five minutes before I had to Google how to send an email using Outlook. Um, anyway, <laughs> turns out the send button was at the top of the screen next to the address bar. And for me, that made no sense because the way I go about things is I put in who I'm sending the email to, I write the email and then I send it. So I couldn't see it. I, I don't know why, I just, it just wasn't in existence. <laughs> It was a terrible thing. And then I went to use the browser version of Outlook and the position of the send button had changed again. So that was fun. That was a fun day for me. So for people with cognitive disability, multiple bad user experiences, one after the other, will stack up. It increases stress, it worsens cognition, and it just makes everything horrible. And ultimately, it's really, really frustrating. And often, the end result is that users will simply abandon a process before it's complete, or just because it's too difficult and the outcome isn't worth the energy investment. And that's something to think about if you want people to use your apps, if you want people to use your online stores, if they can't access it, they're not gonna do it. So, as you've gathered by now, the range of possible impairments that are, 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 that are encapsulated by the term cognitive disability are huge, um, and sometimes accessibility requirements can be contradictory. So some people prefer to chat to Veronica on the chat, on the chat box because they find it easier than navigating the social cues, talking face to face, while others don't have the literacy skills to be able to um, talk to each other in that way. So what are you actually gonna do about it, right? <laughs> like it's just so overwhelming to even think about where you'd begin. So. The Web Content and Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG 2.1, has a few guidelines to address a cognitive impairment, but not many. I hear that it's being worked on. <laughs> um, and the Web Accessibility Initi Initiative has a best practice guide to cognitive impairment as well. But the thing that I would recommend is that you realise that the solutions to accessibility for cognitive impairments actually the lie in design and content. To elaborate, I have a story for you. The septuagenarian and the smartphone. So my dad, he's in his early 70s, 
And last year he closed his shop and he began working from home. And I thought, hey, it's a really good idea. Let's get him a smartphone. So he's pretty savvy with technology. He used computers all the time at work. I didn't think it would be an issue. So I gave him an Android phone to try. He found it confusing because, to quote him directly, it was illogical to any human. Because it didn't work in a way that he was expecting and he couldn't work it out. So he was constantly calling me from his landline to whinge about the phone, to try and get it to work. And it was so painful. And we were both extraordinarily happy when the phone died. It's the best day of my life. My phone's not working. Excellent. But he did need a phone. So in the interim, while I tried to figure out this problem, I gave him an iPhone to try. All I did was teach him how to make a call and receive a call. I had learned my lesson. There was no way I was going to try anything else. But within the week, I started getting text messages. And then he started sending me photos. I started sending him text messages and photos. And so it's been about three months now. And he's moved almost exclusively to his iPhone. Basically uses his laptop for emails because he can't read the screen. Um, so I was like, what, what's going on here? You know, I get, they were both smartphones, right? What was the difference? And so it was all about the self-directed learning that the iPhone made possible. It was consistent in its design. He knew how to get back home. If he opened an app that he didn't want, he knew by the colors of the apps what each one was, so he didn't have to read the little writing. Um, so it was really simple for him and really relieving to me because I hate teaching my dad technology. Um, so <laughs> this made me realize that technology can really be simple and accessible when it's well designed. And that designing for accessibility doesn't need to have a different interface. That any interface in design is pretty much OK. You just have to do it well. So how do you do this? Well, I have eight very, very basic steps to get you started. So number one, make your design and content logical for the user. Ask yourself where items that require action, like buttons, are placed. Does it make sense for them to be there? Is, there, like, is that where you would look if you wanted that button? If it's a website, are your pages consistent? Is it easy for people to understand where they are in relation to the rest of the content? Can they easily get back to the beginning? And is it simple enough that users can look at how to use it or navigate through it without a lot of help? Two. Don't reinvent the wheel. Now, I don't know if any of you were at Ali Bites back in May when I gave a talk about um, my battle with online form and a date input that took me five minutes per date and wasted an hour of my time just putting in dates. Um, it was really complicated. I ended up actually vomiting because it was so bad, which is a very real thing when you have a cognitive disability. Um, so it's very frustrating. And there was no logical reason that they had chosen this particular date picker. The form didn't need it. It was completely new and different from everything else. My feeling is that someone said, hey, I built this amazing thing. And we should absolutely use it because it's cool. And no one else is, so therefore it's great. That's not a good enough reason to do anything. And you need to believe me that when I say sometimes, the tried and the tested way of doing things is actually the best way to do things, even if that process hasn't changed in years. There is a reason that cars don't have square wheels. Do not build a car with square wheels, please. Number three. Three? Yes, three. Um, provide choice. That's content that can be presented in different ways without changing key information or structure. Give your users the ability to zoom text, although with tablets and stuff, that's sort of kind of easy now. Uh, change how content is displayed. And if you have a video or a sound recording, make sure it's closed captioned and provide a transcript as well. As mentioned earlier, people with cognitive disabilities develop strategies to assist them to do what they need to do. Make your content adaptable, and this helps them. You will get brownie points for doing this. If you're going to radically change your designs, either allow your users to revert back to an older version or 
make the new design easy to learn and easy to um, get help if they do get stuck. So make good documentation. So recently, Google redesigned its email inbox. And the attachment icons sat under the subject headings on the email. And I found it really difficult to distinguish what attachments belong to which email, and then even to distinguish between the emails. It was really quite horrible for me. However, they allow you to change how it's displayed. So I changed from the default design to the compact design that removed the attachments. And now it works for me. I'm happy with this. I like it. The home page from the Strokes Foundation Enables Me slide has an accessibility option. So users um, can choose how they want to see the page just by clicking an accessibility button. And they can choose from easy read English. And there's also options that allow for stuff like how links are displayed, contrast. It's really kind of awesome and um, really simple to do. The whole website changes just from this one little box. It's great. Try it out. Have a play. Um, OK. Number four, provide enough time. Timeouts and screen readers are not just frustrating. The user may still be interacting with them when it changes or access is ended. So let users know if a task is, is time sensitive and provide a way for them to save data in case they're out of time before access is ended. And but be aware that countdown timers, even when they're really long, like I've seen some that are like an hour long, are really, really stressful. Um, especially for users who know that they're already slow at inputting information because it just adds this stress. You feel like you're battling the clock. Even though it doesn't seem logical if it's an hour and it'll take you five minutes, it's a battle. So it adds pressure. And as we've learned, that when you get stressed and you have a cognitive impairment, it makes it worse. So sometimes timeouts are necessary. All you have to do is tell the user that it's happening and provide them a way to stop it. Just a little box, a pop-up even. This is an acceptable use of a pop-up because it's useful. Say, hey, we're going to time out. If you're still using this page, you can click this button. And yeah, three minutes? Damn, OK. Five. That's uh, <laughs> OK. Five, provide guidance. Uh, that's information to the user that explains what you need from them. and. Um, that stuff like if they need documentation to fill out a form, tell them what it is straight up so they're not having to run off to find it mid-form. Um, if they make a mistake, tell them where it is, what it was, and highlight the area if you can. This 404 error slide from WebAIM is really a great example of that. It tells the user that the page was not found. Here are some things that you can do. It's actionable by the user to try and solve their own problems. So. Keep it simple, keep it clear. Content writers, I have English degrees. I know what it feels like to go into the boardroom and everyone to make your little Camelot joke about the round table and no one laugh. So it's really very tempting to signal how great your literary skills are by your writing because you really want your people to like just not read your stuff but kind of feast on it. So this is your skill as a writer. Just, you know, no, don't do it. Um, keep it simple, jargon free and technical. Add, no, not technical. If it's technical, provide a glossary, explain the terms, and even um, let users refer backwards to something. And OK, I don't know what number this is. Thank you, seven. Thank you, crowd. <laughs> OK, uh, what your content looks like is just as important as how it's written. Uh, break it up into short paragraphs that are easy to consume. Don't justify your text. Think about your choice of font and don't make lots of font changes throughout your documents. Um, think about how the letters are spaced in your font, both vertically, vertically and horizontally. Um, and be consistent in font use across content, which I think I said. Make your headings useful. It's how people navigate through your websites. WCAG has heaps of information on this, and it's relevant to cognitive impairments as well. If you're going to add, add graphics, um, that help explain key information, go for it, but just don't use the graphics as um, an alternative to text because you have to remember that cultural uh, situations actually affect interpretation of images. So if someone isn't in your culture or in your group, 
they might not know what that image means. And if you haven't explained it in the text somewhere, it's useless. You've basically rendered them illiterate. Uh, okay, number eight, the most important. And if you get nothing else from this whole talk, this is the one that you need to come away with. Think accessible from the beginning. People with disability need to be thought of before you even do anything design-wise. Include them every step of the process and test, test, test. Um, automated accessibility testing is great and it can bring up some issues, but really, you cannot get any more value. It's like the price, it's value. This absolutely prizes the value that you get from actually watching people with disability interact with your products. Um, you will learn so much in such a short, short session. Um, so you're going to make mistakes. Learn from them. You know, listen to your users about the issues they're experiencing and work with them to make improvements. So when it comes to accessibility, they're the experts. Listen to what they tell you. And that's just a really, really ugly, badly designed steps, but hey, let's click a picture. So everyone with a disability has a different experience. When you've met one person with a disability, you have met one person with a disability. So don't make assumptions about what it looks like or what a disability is. Be open to learning about new things. If you approach accessibility with a universal design in mind, what you end up with is accessibility not being an us and them problem, but an everybody solution. Thank you. Alley Camp, October 2018.